this little magic thing whereby your phone always knows where you are and why advertisers also always know where you are and it's actually a sort of miracle and I tried to summarize this talk on Twitter two days ago and I came up with this um, global navigation systems consist of 100 spacecraft that beep at you uh, it turns out this is actually true that's what they do and but the surprise already there is why are there 100 because that that's like a lot and um, but they don't only beep at you, they beep at you with a very precise frequency. Exactly once every 1.0000000 seconds. It's actually nine zeros in a row. It's like pretty precise stuff. So if you could be able to listen to all these satellites with your own ears right now, you would like 33 of them, one third, is actually reaching us right now. And if you would put it on speaker, that would sound like prrp, prrp, prrp. And your phone listens to the noises and says, you are at MCH. It's like really nice. And uh, this, yeah, there's the sound again. Uh, the prrp is not enough to know where you are. The satellites also tell you where they are. And if you know where the satellites are, and you measure the timing of the prrp, then you can calculate where you are. It's nice. It's pretty nice stuff. And um, Oh, and there is no authentication on this at all, in any way. So these signals that come to us from space, they are like really weak. They're actually so weak, they are weaker than the, they are below the noise floor. That means that if someone else also transmits these prrp signals, they, they are quite credible and strong. And you could maybe transmit like, oh, I don't know, 40 kilometers of fake GPS signals. And this has been, keep, been keeping people busy for a long time now, and finally there are some solutions. Uh, here's another way of thinking about this, under spacecraft that beep at you so that Google can, can track you all day. And actually Google is currently one of the innovators in having multi-frequency uh, GPS, which allows you to not only locate where the user is, but also exactly which shop window in front he is staying. So that's nice. That's nice. Um, I shared this on Twitter. And people said this 100 spacecraft beeping at you stuff is not complete. It is actually 100 very good atomic clocks yelling the time at you from space. Uh, which is also true. So there are many ways to think about this stuff. So now let's, let's start with the granddaddy of them all, GPS. Um, and this is such a problem that people, GPS was, was the first one by a few years. And GPS now actually stands for the whole satellite navigation technology. And you have to spend some time thinking about those poor Russians and Europeans and Chinese people also having their own satellite navigation systems. And everyone says, oh, you are working on GPS. No, that's the American stuff. It's been around. Now, it is pretty good. It's also very old. It's like extremely old. When they build GPS, um, GPS is amazing technology, and it's all the more amazing if you realize they started in 1973. The spec has been developed since 1973, and parts of it are sort of hard to read by now, because they are very much operating from a sort of electrical engineering perspective. So we think in terms of sending bits and bytes, and they really talk about voltages. And, uh, and, and I have a picture that shows that next up. Um, GPS is extremely reliable and also extremely boring. They almost never change anything. When they change something there, it takes them like 12 years. Uh, the key systems are like on 8-inch floppy disks still. And, and everyone is worried that the GPS ground segment will one day just implode, because it's literally full of, well, uh, grandfather software. Uh, there are local really old people working on GPS. but. Um, it, it was the first, so we can forgive it a few things. There is no forward error correction on GPS. There is a super stupid parity on uh, the GPS signals, and it is so bad that you will, every day you will get signals that pass all the parity checks and are still wrong, simply because the parity check is so weak that if you make two mistakes, it goes like, well, now it's good again. And, um, but, I mean, 
GPS is like this reliable piece of technology that has been there, it never breaks. It's never very good, because it's not the most precise system, uh, but it's also never very bad, so which is, well, it's nice. Um, there are political elements to GPS. The American government used to degrade the GPS performance, um, and they turned that off in 1992. But since then, they have also apparently degraded it in specific regions of the world sometimes. It's hard to get proof for this stuff, because it happened before the big monitoring projects that we have now. Um, but there is this, this feeling that GPS is a military project, and I can confirm to you that is the, that is the case. If you try to talk to these people, they come back to, with, with all kinds of forms, and, and they're sort of even annoyed that you talk to them, and they have a special division for civilians, that civilians can talk to, and those people, I don't know, they don't talk to the rest, I think. Um, and this has escalated at, at times. It was not possible to visit the GPS status page, because it was secret. And they found a construction where they found a volunteer, and they told him the situation, and he would then suddenly put that on his website. It's weird. So, but the GPS is clearly a military project, but it's super reliable, it's never super good, but it's Always, it's the old faithful. There's some mysteries around it. Um, there are classified parts of the GPS protocol that, that you sometimes see referenced, and then you hear nothing more about it ever again. And, and I also do not ask. Um, and the other mystery about the GPS satellites is that they are huge. They're like five times as big as Galileo satellites, which is the European GPS, and no one knows why. And so it might be that the GPS satellites can have rockets and can evade attacks. I don't know. But something has to be in all those thousands of kilos. No, we don't know. Ah, this is, you see these, at the beginning of documents, you always see these hopeful tables where people fill out revisions and stuff, and they never do. The GPS people do. And uh, this document has been going since 1983. You can just download it, and it explains how GPS works. And it has all these kinds of this tables. And this is a sort of an example of what I mean by, by how different these people live. You see that this is a, a, a sort of schema of a, of a GPS message. And, um, and you see that on top it says direction of data flow from space vehicle. So they actually tell you that the, the, the data will come in in this order. So it's not just a message and it tells you how to parse the message. It actually tells you how the message will arrive. All those letters P you see in between are parity bits. And for some reason, they put all the parity bits between the other bits, which makes it pure hell to parse. Yeah, I see some people are like shocked, but apparently they had a great reason for this, and I don't know what it is. Um, some of these bits are also uh, must be, are not defined, but it turns out that if, the, if they change, that something interesting is going on. So you can sort of have a lot of fun looking at these messages. Russia. And Russia had its, because the US had GPS, Russia also had, had to have a system. And these people were really advanced. It's, it's, we sometimes may think, oh, these Russians and their, their rockets explode and whatever. No, they had their own space shuttle, shuttle project, which was super advanced. And they had GLONASS, which is also super advanced. And you can tell how good it is. It survived the fall of communism. They built it in the Soviet Union. It's a real Soviet Union system. If you see the old specs, it has hammers and sickles on it. And, um, and then, during the fall of the communism, they didn't have any money to maintain it anymore, so in the, the satellites started failing. And then, when they struck oil and we started paying them again, they rebuilt all their satellites. And now, with the war in Ukraine, they're even expanding the network. So, it's a very serious system. All the other navigation systems are sort of copies of GPS. They work the same way, use the same tricks, same mathematics, and the Russians, they, they, they just did it differently. And I'm not sure if it's wise. They did some very extremely strange things. One of the strangest things is that GPS and all the other systems run on a simple time scale based on the number of seconds since the epoch, an epoch, which is the same way of doing it. Because that means you do not have to worry about leap seconds, you do not have to worry about daylight saving. Everything is lots simpler if you do it the GPS way. GLONASS runs on actual wall clock Moscow time. 
That means that if they do a leap second, the whole system has to instantaneously adjust. They also, for a period, had summer and winter time in Moscow, which also really did not help. But the system faithfully broadcast Moscow wall clock time. But because they thought that, I don't know, UTC was a Western imperialistic invention or something, I don't know. Um, it's still around. It has all kinds of weird failures for which they blame the West. And um, still used, though, because it works. They have all kinds of documentation for it, and it's sort of fun to read it. They have different variants of the documentation. Some are very ugly, and these turn out to be correct. And there are prettier versions of the documentation, and these are wrong. Um, I encountered this formula in there, uh, because I want to calculate something about GLONASS, and it says this is the formula you need to use, and this is like so complicated. But I, I decided to give it a try anyhow, and it doesn't work. So I asked one of my Russian friends, and he said, oh, yeah, that formula is a joke, no one uses it. Yeah. And then, because he's a really good friend, he implemented the correct formula and submitted that to my project. So that's nice. The Chinese, um, they are, I don't know, this is like, uh, you should, we should all be very impressed. I think this is a sort of lesson in here. Uh, they have not one, not two, but three Baidu systems. And they innovate extremely quickly. And which also leads to a lot of unhappy people on the ground, because suddenly the signals are different and they no longer work. But the new signals are just better. And in, in a very short amount of time, they iterated to a system that appears to be much better than what we have. They have more satellites in more orbits, they use more frequencies, and shit. <laughs> Um, but we can use it, we can appreciate it, but there is a lesson in there for us that where GPS and Galileo take like five years to plan an iteration, by that time the Chinese people have done three already. Uh, they used to be very open and cooperative, so they used to be part of all the international GNSS bodies, and that is now uh, less so the case. And, uh, and it's also sort of becoming unclearer how it all works. This is from the Wikipedia, and you see the many, many ways Baidu transmits signals here. Every column is one way, and there are now question marks in some of these columns, because part of it is no longer documented uh, or no longer known. So it, it's, it's going a bit dark on Baidu. But still, it's a very impressive uh, achievement. Europe. Europe also has a... Uh, GNSS system. So we have our own navigational needs. And this was initially started because we were a bit worried about GPS. Because the US can always turn off GPS, and then Europe would have to rely on GLONASS, which they didn't like. So they said, we need our own system. And the US said, no, you really don't. Really, you don't. It's, it's not necessary. Mm. And then they said, yeah, there are also all kinds of technical reasons why you should not be doing this. And uh, it's all wrong, and it's bad, even. And, and they wrote pretty nasty letters about this, and this led to a big fight, and eventually... And, and actually, the, US, the EU was such a mess at that point, that even if America had done... No, if they had done nothing, we would have probably given up on the project. Uh, but since the US hated it, some people in Brussels were like, well, maybe that means we should do it. And... Um, and people suspected that spending billions of euros on this stuff, because they spent like 10 billion euros on it, that a large part would, would go to the European uh, defense and space industries, and that would keep them alive, because we're not very good at investing in space and defense here. And it turns out this was probably true. So they, they spent 10 billion euros designing and launching this, this Galileo system, and now we have one. And in hindsight, it's probably actually not the worst idea to do it. Um, it's more precise than GPS, there's more frequent updates, uh, the modulation has forward error correction, which is so good that I have never seen a corrupted message. Uh, the CRC check is like super nice, and um, they're innovating at a nice clip, they're actually doing new things that no one else is doing. So in theory, of all the navigation systems, when it works, Galileo is the very best. And it quite often does not work. And that's sort of where the problem lies. So if your GPS is like this super reliable farm horse that will always do what you want, and G Galileo is like this race horse that you, just, you need to keep him happy, and, and, and otherwise he doesn't perform. And um, 
So, and it's underpowered. They didn't quite launch enough satellites, and some of them broke in interesting ways. And um, when it breaks, they say, no, no, it's normal. So they were like really good bureaucrats. So they defined, uh, so you would say we have a satellite that it works or if it doesn't work. And what they did is they defined an in-between status where it actually also does not work, but then you call it marginal. And, and then you say that if the satellite is marginal, you don't have to report on it. Which means that your satellites can be like super broken and you're like, well, it's all fine here. And they really believe that, because I, 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 by now they, they've, I have lots of contacts there, and sometimes I, I tell them, look, it's broken. No, 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 Bert, it's marginal. I say, look, my phone doesn't use it. Your own documents tell everyone not to use marginal satellites. Yeah, but that's their problem. No, it's, it's not good. So how did that happen? How did it come that way? And prepare your mind, because this is, this is going to suck. Boom. This is how Galileo gets governed. And, um, and I showed this to people, and they said, no, no, it's not correct. I said, oh, no, it's worse. <laughs> and, um, and then also Brexit happened, and, and, and it's all not good. And, um, and it's actually sort of amazing how well it works, <laughs> considering this. And the only reason that it works is because, really, because of people like us, real die-hard geeks that want to make it work. So there are people there that work for one part of this diagram and they know the people in the other part of the diagram and they go like, you need to do this right now. And then it works. So this really runs, and I, I recently met one of these guys, and he's extremely modest. But without that single guy, I don't think Galileo would have worked. And, and he's a real super nice engineer, so I, I hope he listens. Thanks. So, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll make sure he watches the recording. So, um, so maybe, maybe good to know. People often ask me, does anyone actually use Galileo? Does anyone actually use Baidu? Uh, and, and yes, it turns out every phone that you bought in the last few years uses all these systems all the time. Um, Android phones will lovingly tell you everything about each satellite they're using and why not, and it's, it's super nice. And, and if you have an Apple phone, Apple just says, you are here. I don't know why, I don't know how I figured it out, but you're here. And, and that is so annoying for Apple users that there actually are the sort of fake apps that try to calculate what your Apple phone is likely doing. So if you want to do anything with GPS, get an Android phone. Uh, some Android phones uh, accidentally have extremely powerful chips that actually can be used for geodetic purposes, like one centimeter resolution which usually requires these big, big things with big antennas, and now you can just show up with your phone. Um, so all the phones try to use many, as many of these satellites as they can, and why do they do that? When we sit in this nice tent, um, if you have an Android phone, you will probably see 25 satellites that are being used right now for navigation, which is nice. Um, if you are walk, walking around in a city, you have buildings left and right from you, and you only see a small part of the sky. And your phone is in your pocket, which means that the half of the sky is also gone. So actually you have to realize that your phone is listening to these satellites from your pocket. And that means that it loves to start with 33 satellites that it could maybe receive, and if it's lucky from your, the pocket from your pants, it can see five. And that's enough to get a fix. So that's the actual reason why uh, phone manufacturers were so eager to use all these new satellite systems so they can track you better. Um, there's an interesting case here. Um, the phone listens to the, the, the Chinese systems and the American systems and the European system and the Russian system. What if these systems say different things? Which could happen? There are algorithms in the phone that then decide to maybe kick out GLONASS. As I say, the GLONA system is the outlier, um, so let's, let's ignore that for a bit. Or maybe one satellite is an outlier because you're receiving it via a reflection. So there are also interesting algorithms in there uh, to get the best fix. But no one knows what would happen if, you, if GPS starts transmitting all kinds of weird things, 
would the system then really, would the phones move over to Baidu and Galileo? And we don't know, because no one has ever tested this. And whenever I try to test something without GPS, you find that software breaks. Because GPS is always there, it is always on. So many of these systems use GPS as the backbone. So we don't really know what happens if GPS fails. And um, more research is clearly needed, and I hope that you will feel up to that. Because it turns out that if you have the right software-defined radio thing, you can actually send out GPS signals. Do so at an extremely low power level, though, because otherwise you might get all kinds of new friends. <laughs> and, um, but you can actually do this. There are these, these 100,000 euro Rode and Schwarz simulators, which allow you to simulate one GPS signal. Um, but it turns out it is very doable to do this kind of thing. And no one knows how the world's phones would react to strange signals. So then at one point, I asked some of the people in the industry, do you do any uh, fuzzing of uh, signals? Do you know what, what the chipsets would do? And they said, what is fuzzing? <laughs> so, so then I explained it to them what that means, and they said, oh no, that would not be necessary because the satellite would not, would not do that. <laughs> uh, well, okay, um, that's good. Um, and I, I got nowhere, I really got nowhere. I said, can you do some experiments with the sort of malicious signals? Could you maybe sort of insert a fake uh, satellite that slowly drifts? But could it maybe take the whole constellation with it? And they said, yeah, super interesting uh, subject. And can we talk about something else? Um, so you can do this. You can just do this very weak signal, have a software-defined radio, there's GNSS SDR, which is part of GNU Radio, you can download it, it can create signals. And I'm, I'm, I personally predict that if you start fuzzing these systems, they will just crash. Which would be like super fun. And the reason why it's super fun is you could put your uh, software-defined radio system somewhere in an airplane or whatever, broadcast at a few watts, and blanket out all Android phones. Uh, not to give you any ideas, of course. Uh, but, but do fuzz this stuff, because it's unfuzzed. And we all know what happens when stuff is unfuzzed. Yeah, use a Faraday cage, make one with aluminum foil, and just say, I'm not kinky, I'm just wrapped in aluminum foil. Um, figure something out. So we're going to talk about the satellites. What does a, a GPS or GNSS satellite actually look like? And this is a real one. This is a Galileo satellite. And it's, it's sort of big, but uh, most of that stuff is, is solar panels that will fold out. And, um, and it, these, this one has four atomic clocks. Why does it have four atomic clocks? Because they suck and they die. And uh, I think if these people would have a choice, they would have launched now with eight atomic clocks, because they actually break a lot. And, um, and what these clocks do, every second, and really every second, they send out a message, and that message might simply be beep. Some of these messages are nothing other than beep, but other ones actually contain information about the orbit of the satellite, or how well is the atomic clock doing, because it turns out that atomic clocks are not as magic as you might think. They actually drift, and they speed up, and do all kinds of things you need to monitor them. So the satellite transmits, this is my orbit, these are the corrections to my orbit, this is how well my clock is doing, and also statistics on cable lengths. And now you may wonder, why, why does that matter? Uh, these systems transmit on different frequencies. The antenna is in one place, but there are different cable lengths, which means that the satellite on one frequency appears to be a bit further away from you than on the other frequency. And it turns out all these satellites are individuals and different, so the system actually says, well, there is like 12 centimeters between this frequency and that frequency. And each satellite has its own settings for that. It also tells you about the atmosphere, because it turns out the atmosphere can like move you 10 meters in delays. So the satellite gives you all kinds of information about the atmosphere, specifically the ionosphere, so you can try to compensate for that. The system also gives you information about its own health. So the satellite will say, trust me, or don't trust me, or I am marginal, which is a status we invented so we don't have to report to the European Commission. Um, it also tells you about the dreaded leap seconds, 
Um, and these days, it also sends out some cryptographic authentication data in an extremely weird way. Um, why do we even need to send uh, orbit updates? Because Kepler invented the laws of elliptical orbits. You could just say, this is the satellite's orbit, and it's going to stay in that orbit, and nothing is going to change that orbit. And it turns out I made this terrible graphic, because no one else made one, apparently. Uh, you have the satellite, and it's also being attracted by the moon. And it's also being attracted by the sun, and sunlight is shining on it, trying to push the satellite away. And also, and you can barely see it on this graph, the Earth is not quite round. It's a little bit flat, and it's also a bit lumpy. And that also means that the orbit of the satellite is not quite an ellipse. It doesn't differ that much from an ellipse, but it differs enough from the ellipse that you would be on the other side of the street or even on the other side of your town. So it has to transmit all these uh, live updates. Um, just very briefly over this one, because I think we realize how this works. The satellite beeps. It tells you where it is. That means that you know how far away you are from the satellite. And if you receive signals from enough satellites, all the circles, or actually spheres, intersect, and you know where you are. This is the sort of basic theory, and this is actually the part that, is, that people get right. This is actually how it does work. So how to get a fix? The fix is by uh, that it says, you are here, and this is the time. How to get that? The satellite, uh, the, the phone, or whatever, gathers the so-called pseudo-ranges, which are the distances to all these satellites. And, um, and then it corrects for general relativity. So people sometimes say, what good is general relativity? How does it, would it ever impact my life? Well, it would, you would, your car would impact things if we did not correct for this. And I'll get to that later. And a lot of math happens. And then, in bold, dark arts happen. It turns out, if you just do these calculations from scratch, you will not quite end up in the right location. There are lots of weird additions. For example, you have to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. Because while the signal traveled down from the sky, the Earth rotated a little bit, and you want to know where you are right now, not where you were one and a half seconds ago. And there's a lot of real dark arts going on. When I do this, when I try to do these, co these, these calculations by, my, by hand, or at least my computer do it, I end up like with 20 meter accuracy. And I don't know how people get it any more precise. You really have to have a good atmospheric model, ionospheric model, understand some magic delays, but it's, it's, it's a lot of interesting stuff happens. Now, we're all used that you get your phone and it immediately tells you where you are. Of course, the phone has a bit of history, it knows where you were, but we expect very rapid updates by now. At first, um, before we know where we are, we have to listen to the satellites so the satellites can tell us where they are. It's an extremely low bandwidth channel. So when we had the original standalone GPS receivers like these, which are, by the way, part of a small giveaway here, but I'll get to that. If you have a standalone GPS receiver, it might take like 10 minutes before it has a fix. And it could even be like 20 minutes if you're unlucky. But you can also download from the internet a stream that already tells you where all the satellites are and how their clocks are doing, which means you only need to listen to the beep. And actually, that is what phones these days do. They download all the GPS information from a server somewhere, from Google, and that allows them to figure out where they are within a few seconds. Uh, and you need to buy that data. I accidentally also generated such a stream of data, and suddenly people started using it. But I'll get to that, because it was also fun. But this way, your phone is actually geolocating itself using the internet and, with, and the satellites. It's no longer on its own. So, um, orbits and clocks. Um, how often do you need an update? Before I delved into this a few years ago, I thought that GPS might need an orbit update once every three months or so, because the orbits are stable enough. And it turns out that it's like every two hours, or even every 20 minutes. So if you have old data on the orbit and the clock, your position will start to drift rather quickly. And 
That means that from the ground, people have to monitor the positions of the satellite all the time. Because we need to figure out why is the satellite, where is it? Is it one meter too high? Because if the satellite is flying one meter higher than we thought it is, that means that your position will also shift one meter, if you didn't know that. So you need to figure out in real time where all these satellites are and how their clocks are doing. Now, there are monitoring stations around the world that keep track of that, that listen to when the beeps come in, and it's tricky work. Because if a clock on a satellite goes beep a little bit early, that could mean that the clock is running slightly too fast, or that the satellite is a bit lower and closer to you than you thought. Which really sucks, because you would like to know the difference. And we'll get to how, how hard that is, because you need to follow all these satellites and keep state. And the experienced people will already know that keeping state is asking for problems. So this is what these, uh, 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 these clocks look like. Um, the left one actually looks like it could be quite big, and it's hard to get a sense of scale, but it's like this big. And it costs two and a half million euros. And it breaks. And it's made. And actually, the fun thing is, who do you think? Where do you think the best clocks in Europe are made? In Switzerland. It's actually true. And um, it's a Swiss company. And uh, and they make this one, which is like a, a hydrogen maser, and it's like super good, especially when it works. And on the right is a more boring one. This is a rubidium standard, and that one is also good, and but not as precise. So there are four, there are two of the, 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 the Maser ones and two of the Rubidium ones on the Galileo satellites. And you have to realize three nanoseconds is one meter. And uh, in the top graph, you can see the drift rate from one of these clocks, and that is like one and a half milliseconds per, uh, nanoseconds per hour. Which is good if you know that. Uh, and you see that it sort of uh, oscillates around an average, which, uh, which has complicated reasons. But if you did not keep track of this, you would be shifting by one meter every two hours, uh, which is not good. So you really have to keep track of that. And this is, by the way, one of the graphs that comes out of my monitoring uh, project. Um, the relativistic correction, and I love this stuff. Um, if you are higher up, there is less gravity and time runs a little bit faster, which is fun when you study physics. It's a tiny effect. And uh, it turns out this tiny effect um, also actually works on uh, satellites, but they have a perfectly circular orbit, so they should never be higher or lower. They should be at the same height all the time. It turns out that it's actually not true. They, they go up 50 kilometers too much somewhere. And that is enough to completely mess up your navigation. So on the ground, the system calculates how much the relativistic effect has been and compensates for that. So, thank you, Einstein. Oh, there he is. And, um, oh, he didn't know, but uh, thank you. To make life a little bit more difficult, to just appreciate how hard the work is that these people are doing, um, when we listen to a GPS or a Galileo satellite, what we hear is the antenna. That is the signal we receive. But it's not the antenna that is or in orbit, it's the center of mass of the satellite that is in orbit. And these things are like one and a half meters apart. Oh, well, who cares? Well, actually, there are people that care about one and a half meters. And enable to, to, to enable real good precision, you need to know the difference between the center of mass and the center of phase. And the problem now is that the people on the ground that monitor the satellites, they can only hear the antenna they cannot hear the center of mass. That means that they have an incredibly uh, complicated model of the mass distribution of the satellite, which they all weigh, which actually involves hanging up the satellite by a wire, just to see how it hangs. And, uh, and then they, main, they, they keep a record of that and compensate for that. So that's how... And they also have to measure the cable lengths of everything. It's, it's really hard work. So they have to monitor the satellites from all over the world, this is where the Galileo monitoring centers are. And that sounds really nice and impressive, a Galileo monitoring center. And some of them are just in a field, uh, and you can just go there. And, uh, and actually, we have volunteers in our project that actually do go there and then take pictures. And then security guards come out and say, why are you doing that? And, uh, and they're all, yeah, it just, it's, it's just in the field. 
And if anyone messes with that, the whole system goes down. If you ask people where are the GPS monitoring centers, they all go like, and we're not telling you. And uh, the Galileo people are like, well, you can maybe get a tour. Um, so might this ever go wrong, all this complexity? Well, you know where this is going. Uh, in 2019, the whole Galileo system went down. And not only did it go down, the whole administrative surroundings and management also broke. So when the system was clearly down, there were these people doing this, this, this Baghdad uh, presenter that there are no problems with Galileo. <laughs> Galileo is fine. And, uh, and I later found out that these people were actually thought that that was true. So the communications within the project were so terrible that they had these people going out and saying, oh, it's all good. How would I know? And, um, and this, this lasted for seven days, which is like tremendously bad. So it made CNN and it made uh, the register. And then they did a big review. How could this possibly go wrong? And they ended up blaming one guy. Einstein, yeah, you could, you could blame him, maybe, but no, they blamed one system administrator. And we all know how terrible that is, because if you built a system where one system administrator could take down everything down for seven days, you didn't do a good job. It was not that one person, but they tried to blame this one person. I had become a little bit noted in Galileo at that point, so I made some noise about that, and that got picked up by Politico, which is a big Brussels newspaper, and then they said, oh, no, it's not that one guy, there were other aspects as well. Can we talk about something else? Uh, well, it's all on the Wikipedia, outages in Galileo, and in 2020, the same thing happened. Now, uh, what actually happened there was, I mentioned to you how difficult it is to know... Hello? Yeah, I'm back. If a satellite clock is running a bit fast, or if the satellite is just a bit further away from you or a bit closer. That is, there is a degeneracy between these measurements. And the only way to disambiguate that is to keep track of all the satellites so you know what the state of the whole system is. That state does not only include all the satellites in space, but also your bank of own atomic clocks, which also drift, just to make life a bit interesting. And once you lose that state, the system at one point says, I cannot reconverge uh, rapidly, I'm going to reconverge from scratch. Which means that the system sits there and says, how many satellites are there? Let's see how much I can hear. And it takes 48 hours to reconverge. And during that 48 hours, you have no satellite system. Now, this is so important that you might say, why don't you have multiple instances of this software that tracks all these satellites. And they do have multiple instances of exactly the same software. And so when one breaks, the other one goes like, oh, I break too. <laughs> so we have full redundancy in breaking. And so, so I, I had a meeting with them a few weeks ago. And uh, oh, oh, by the way, the, the Galileo people, they never officially talk to me. They just take me out for really good food. And, um, and then, and I'll explain why later, because you might wonder. But and and, and then they said, I said, why don't you have two copies of the software? And they said, no, we have four of them. I said, yeah, they're all exactly the same. And I said, and they said, yeah, should we build another one then? I said, well, maybe, would be nice. Okay, uh, we're going to speed up because we're way out of time. Um, when this big failure happened in 2019, no one noticed. Really, no one noticed. Why did no one notice? In 2019, not that many phones were using Galileo in the first place, and the phones that were using Galileo just shifted back to GPS. So no one really noticed. And that's, well, that's good, because it's redundant and it's nice. Um, the official people, they said there is no incident, or it's just a partial outage, or whatever. No, it was like the fullest outage ever. And there was also no unofficial data. Because whenever we have people that monitor our power, that monitor our oil pipelines, our gas pipelines, the, the amount of sunlight, we can find on the internet, we can find monitors for everything. Not for Galileo. No one had built anything because it was just too boring, I think. Which meant that people could go around, they could say, no, Galileo is fine, it's always fine. Actually, before the big outage in July, when I found archives, I found they had many more outages earlier, just they hadn't told anyone about them. And that's when I thought it might be good if we shine some sunlight on this situation. 
can we monitor all these satellites easily? And it turns out you can. Uh, this was the first receiver, and uh, Goulash used to be in here, a really good one. And, uh, and then there's a Raspberry Pi Zero in there with a very simple GPS receiver, because it turns out there is one chipset that will not only tell you where you are, but will also send you the raw GNSS messages. The U-blocks, they're also Swiss, by the way. And, uh, and it's very nice of them. So I found these things. You could buy them online. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Uh, they were originally seven dollars. They are now 21 euros, which is well, okay, uh, but that's still very affordable. Chip shortage. Chip shortage, the supply chain, you know, and um, and we actually now in our network. So I started asking people, can you join our network? Can you buy one of these machines? And uh, and lots of people did. We have now 80 receivers, and I, I'll talk about a bit more. But we have three orders of magnitude between the smallest, the cheapest station, which is based on this one, and that thing on the right, which is like a super high-end geodetic antenna, which is actually part of the Dutch reference lab for this kind of stuff, but they're nice enough to allow me access to it, as long as I don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is MCH secret stuff, so don't, don't tell anyone. So what do these receivers consist of? A Raspberry Pi, one of these machines, and a very simple, robust delivery protocol where all these receivers around the world send their data to two of my servers. Actually, I am redundant that way. And not only uh, is it redundant on my side, they will also queue data internally and wait for acknowledgement that it was received successfully. And this turns out, this is, people said this protocol is too simple, you cannot do it, and it runs problem-free for the past two years. Uh, so this fills up terabytes of data uh, and it now turns out that since we store every message, and I think that's on the next slide, we, from a forensic perspective, we store the raw messages. And that's a concept that was new to this world. What they used to do was store the conclusions from the chipsets. So the chipset would say, I think I'm here with this level of certainty, and they stored that data. Uh, whereas my system, I said, I'm here for the time that it doesn't work. I'm here for when it's broken. So we have a forensic record of every message being sent by GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and Baidu since late 1990. Uh, sorry, since late 2019. And this has been effective because more than once, actually more than three times, so I'll make it four times, uh, people from the Galileo project actually came to me and said, well, Bert, do you have this data from last Tuesday? <laughs> and, uh, and which is nice, so thank you also to all the volunteers that make that happen, and of course then I work really hard at getting them the data, and because it's... Yeah. No. Okay. So this is also, this is a really nasty graph, this is what an outage looked like on our website, galmon.eu, all the red people would not have coverage if they only relied on Galileo. They also rely on other things, but if you are a project, you do not want this sort of red thing hanging over Asia. And it also moves around. So you can see this live on galmon.eu and the map. Uh, this is from this morning what Galileo looks like. All the red satellites are unhealthy or broken. This is also not what you want to see. And this actually does not show the, the things that are administratively marked as broken. This only shows the things that should be working. So that's your 10 billion euro project. So what do we turn that into? Tweets. And uh, you can follow this account, and it will tweet out all kinds of disruptions. And it's sort of a sort of reverse espionage for me, because I see who follows this account. So apparently, apparently it's offering some kind of worthwhile service. Um, who do we get this data from? Uh, around 80 volunteers. Uh, some of them are like living on extremely remote islands, which gives them a unique vantage point, because they see satellites other people don't see, and they can see jamming and other stuff. Who are these people? Um, lots of radio amateurs, because they like this stuff. Uh, you can also give your station a handle, and there are lots of, of ham, uh, handles in there. Um, we also have two big space agencies that run their own copy of this software. And, uh, and they sort of try to hide that from me, but... I mean, they, so they run their own copy, so I don't see, because it's all open source, you can run it for yourself, and... Two space agencies run their own copy, and somehow I know. Um, I'm sort of proud of that. Um, but that also does bring me, and I'll skip over, if, if, you, if you like this project, I actually really need help to keep this going. Uh, it does not require a lot of help, but it does require a little bit of help. 
So where are these receivers? They're all over the planet. Uh, you can turn that into this <laughs> extremely impressive graph. If you've ever seen war games, you find this a very scary picture. Um, these are the lines between the observers and the satellites uh, they see, so that's also a lot. Uh, this is the architecture, you can look that up if you want, it's like really nice. And these are the Grafana, there's a Grafana server, you can just log into it, public.galmon.eu, and there are lots of graphs on there already, but there could be far more graphs on there. And uh, so this is how old the data is that's coming from the satellites, and when you see those lines go up, their up the updates are coming in late. Uh, this is how an interesting one, and sometimes it turns out we can invent things. Uh, the space agencies have extremely powerful equipment to analyze failures, but I can see that if an update changed the clock of a satellite by three nanoseconds, that it was not good. Because if you have to make a three nanosecond change, you fucked up. And uh, this is a graph of just such changes happening. And, and they were like, yeah, what, what, what are you measuring here? Don't you have your own atomic clock? So, no, I don't have my own atomic clock, but I can see the differences in your predictions. Blah, blah, blah. We also have data for scientists, like really nice. So what is the output? Tweets, live status, the Galmonds, uh, the Grafana server, an archive since 2019, late 2019. Uh, we have this unified stream of all messages. And I made that as a joke for some, not as a joke, someone said it would be nice if we had this unified stream where we receive every message once. And I was like, sure, I can make that for you. I turn it on, and after a few weeks I reboot my workstation, and this guy says, well, you turned off my stream. <laughs> and, um, and since then that stream has become, sorry, popular. Um, other stuff, is it worth it? Does it help? I think it really and I'll really round it off then, but one of the things that helped is that previously Galileo could just fail and no one would notice, which does not help those people improve, because there are very good engineers working there, and they work day and night on making it work. And I want, I want to share one anecdote for you, and, and I'm already feeling unhappy, well, emotional now that I tell it again. They did a complete migration of the uh, Galileo uh, software during Christmas one year. And they did it during Christmas because that was the time when it was quiet at the office, no one was there. And they told me about it, they said, well, we're wondering if you could see it happening. And I was studying it and I could actually see that they made the change at like 2.30 a.m. because there was one message that arrived a little bit earlier than normal. And I told these people, I said, well, that's amazing work you did because that you can do a migration so smoothly that only with forensic detail can I tell that it actually happened, and that you did that middle in the night during Christmas. And then these people, they said, at the office, no one thanked us. And because no one there cared in any way, they're like, just, I don't know, fill out the reports, tell people the satellite is marginal. And uh, so if, if there's one thing I achieved, those people, they were like, well, at least someone cares that we do our job well. Anyhow. Yeah. I think we're going to round it off here. There's so much more I could tell you. There's this small book. It's 1,300 pages. It costs like 200 euros. If you hunt for it, if you hunt for it, you can find the PDF. Everything is in here. They wrote the big book on GNSS. This is the big book on GNSS. Um, to round it off, if you want to do some stuff, and if you are a student, so not if you, not for people with company cars and stuff, but there are two of them, and if you have these, you can plug them in and launch on Galileo Note. And with that, I'd like to round off the presentation. What more can I say, Bert? Thank you so much. Have you ever been on Geo Hipster podcast yet? Not that I, not that I remember. But then uh, I, I'm, 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 I will try to get you on Geo Hipster podcast, and you'll get the T-shirt as well. That will okay. be great. Thank, Thank you, you Bert Hubert.